So I join my colleagues tonight to come here and honor the life of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Uh, as many people have said tonight already, what uh, an unbelievable hero she was, a trailblazer, uh, a deep thinker, the things that she did uh, on the court to do so many important things for the rights of Americans. Um, I think of her when I first met her in 2001, I just came to Washington, D.C., my first year here in the United States Senate, and just happened to go to a play at the, at the Shakespeare Theater uh, here near the Capitol and uh, had seats right next to her in the theater. And I had probably already heard about her and knew of her, of course, her great significance even in 2001. Um, but during the play, I noticed, just as I do in, in a dark situation, oftentimes fall asleep a little bit, and I thought, wow, I don't know. This woman is so petite and so tiny. And I had heard that she had been sick. I literally sat there in the dark, concerned for her future. Well, what a lesson about Ruth Bader Ginsburg, because that was 2001, and in 2020, she was going strong. This is not a woman to ever, ever, ever underestimate. She took her tools and applied them for the betterment of American women and American society overall. And people across the United States of America are reeling from her passing because they want to know who's going to stand up for their rights now that she's gone. There's something about that diminutive figure with so much might and wisdom that succeeded on that group of a court with all those men and had the courage and the tenacity to read her dissent in the Lilly Ledbetter legislation from the bench. The unusual move of saying, I might not have the decision I want today, but by God, you're going to listen to what is wrong with gender inequality in America, and we are going to get on a path to fix it. When I think about that, that unbelievable moment that in her quiet, soft voice, set the stage that we heard our colleague Senator Warren talk about tonight, it's, it's pretty amazing. Because that's why we need to have women in these places. We need to have them so you have the voice of diversity there to tell you what it's like. And I guarantee you, when she said that statement, I don't ask anything from my brother other than to get your foot off my neck, I guarantee you, she knew what that was like, and that is why she says it with such conviction. And that's what she represented. That's what she represented as an icon to so many people, and now they are mourning. I've had 2,000 calls in just a few days to our office about her passing. One constituent, Lynn from Shelton, Washington, said, I'm old enough, quote, I'm old enough to have grown up experiencing the subtle and not so subtle discrimination aimed at girls and women that have limited our self-expression, our participation in sports, in politics, college accessibility and workplace, and even in my family life and reproduction. She continues, it's been slow progress for each of us to achieve increased equality. And so we have so much to thank Ruth Bader Ginsburg for. I'm deeply saddened and frightened, frightened by her passing. As you know, our democracies, freedom, integrity, and the rule of law are threatened and are even at greater risk." End quote. Eileen from Issaquah wrote, quote, Justice Ginsburg fought so valiantly for our rights as women. As women, we provide so much for the Washington economy. I agree with her. <laughs> women provide a lot for our economy in the state of Washington. She continues, quote, I am a business owner myself, and I am terrified that gender protections are in grave danger. Ensuring civil liberties is not just the moral thing to do, 
but it makes sound economic policy as well, allowing more people more opportunities does not take away from those with power, but it grows our economy as a state and as a country and allowing all of us to be more prosperous together. That includes reproductive rights, which is the keystone to allowing women full economic opportunity as men." End quote. You know, I, I have to say, that letter basically just sums it all up. That is what the fight with Lily Ledbetter was. And I thank Lily Ledbetter. I thank Lily Ledbetter for having the courage to file that case and stand up to that discrimination and basically fight a long process that people still don't understand. We do not have pay equity in America yet. We still are not making the same amount as men. Ruth Ginsburg made a decision that set the course for the Lilly Ledbetter Law, which is just basically saying, instead of saying our time to file a case for discrimination runs out after a year, when we don't even know we've been discriminated against, we should have a longer period of time to file that case. So all we're going to get is our day in court. But I thank both Lily Ledbetter and Justice Ginsburg for that because they were women standing up in an incredible environment with men surrounding them and speaking truth to power about what needed to happen for, as my constituent says here, for full economic opportunities for all people. I can't tell you how many men I have heard say, I want equal pay for women. I want equal pay for women because I want my wife to make a decent salary. I want her to bring home as much as she can bring home. I don't want her discriminated against. And yet when Justice Ginsburg set us up for the Lilly Bedletter legislation and we came here to the Senate floor, I heard the most unbelievable speeches here on the Senate floor. Colleagues of ours basically said things like, well, if you will just be as qualified as a man, we'll pay you as much as a man. The disconnect still exists. The pay equity still exists. But the course of action has been set by Justice Ginsburg, and we have just got to pick up the torch and carry this to the finish line because it is good for our economy. It is good for our society. It is good for women to have the type of participation that when you are paid equally to a man, you can continue to contribute in society. 2,000 people have written to me already. It's unbelievable what she has done to touch the hearts of Americans. A father from Bellingham wrote, quote, mostly I mourn for the future of my four-year-old daughter. The prospects of women losing their right to choose and an erosion of gender equality is frightening, end quote. And another constituent, Katie, wrote, quote, even though the air this morning looks relatively clear again in Seattle, a little reference to all our fire and smoke, she continues, our future is foggier than ever. While I mourn the death of Justice Ginsburg, I cannot help but feel tremendous anxiety about the future of existing laws in effect that protect all people's rights from legal abortions to access to health care to laws that protect our votes and our freedom of speech and laws that Justice Ginsburg protected. That's really what's going on here in America. This movement about RBG is you stood up to protect us and now you're gone and what is going to happen? So uh, definitely uh, a pause in this for a little comment about our 
our Senate schedule. I don't, I don't get it. You know, we can sit here and argue back and forth about what people said when and how and all of that. What I don't understand is this. It takes time to review the record of someone for a lifetime appointment to the Supreme Court in which these important issues to working families and whether they have as much power and as much clout and as much standing as a corporation in America, people want to know where they stand. And somehow people are already talking about schedules. I, I don't understand. Like, how can you decide what the schedule is when you haven't even heard the name of a person? How do, you, how do you move forward with a schedule when you don't even know? Maybe this person's going to end up being Harriet Myers. Maybe you're going to look at their record and you're going to say, it's Harriet Myers, and I, I don't want to move forward because I looked at her record and I decided maybe this is not the jurist I want at this point in time. All I'm saying is I don't understand how somebody can set a course of action and a schedule when you don't even know who the person is, what the process is going to be, or the length of time. You are setting a horrible precedence. You're suggesting to people that it doesn't even matter what the name is. You already have a schedule. It doesn't matter how long it's going to take to review. So, very hard here to not have frustration when my citizens have fought so hard for these rights and Justice Ginsburg's passing has upset them so much that they need to hear from us about how a fair and deliberative process, the last wishes of Justice Ginsburg, are going to be honored. So, Mr. President, I would like to add for the record the full dissent that was read from the bench from Justice Ginsburg in the Lilly Ledbetter case. Without objection. Without objection. In that dissent, Justice Ginsburg said, quote, the problem of concealed pay discrimination is particularly acute where the disparities arise not because the female employee is fat, flatly denied a raise, but because male counterparts are given larger raises. Having received a pay increase, the female employee is likely to discern at once that she was experienced an adverse employment decision. She may have little reason even to suspect discrimination until a pattern develops incrementally, and she ultimately becomes aware of the disparity." End quote. Again, I think of what bravery Justice Ginsburg showed in saying to our colleagues that this dissent was so important to read it from the bench. Not everything in the legislative or legal process is easy. It takes bringing awareness to our colleagues. And clearly, there's a lot of awareness that needs to continue to happen here. Working families and their desire to have health care, coverage for pre-existing conditions, protection of reproductive rights, and hundreds of thousands of dreamers wanting to know what the future looks like, and obviously LB TQ rights and whether they are going to be set back. I think of the other time that I had a great interaction with Justice Ginsburg. You know, when I also first got here, we did this dinner every year. My colleague from Hawaii will find this interesting. We in the Senate would be invited, Democrats and Republicans, to have dinner with the Supreme Court. It was a great night. We would go over to the court. We'd have dinner. Actually, the justices would open up their offices and we could tour around. I thought it was really interesting because if you know anything about people, you know, you can almost see how their mind works by the desk they keep. 
Some people keep a messy desk, but they know where every piece of paper is on the desk. Other people have very neat desks, so the whole thing, then letting us into their chambers, talking about the decorum of the Supreme Court, how they shook hands every day, how they all worked with each other to try to keep a, a comedy among the decisions when you're gonna disagree every day was just very interesting. And uh, we usually had some entertainment, uh, but you know, it was kind of a, a moment where we all said, we're in this together and we're gonna keep moving forward. And several years later, I don't even, I'm not even sure whose decision it was. I think maybe around 2000, I'm not even sure what year it was, what, what year they disbanded that. They decided, we're not doing that anymore. And I asked, I said, why are we doing this? This was like one of the greatest things we've done around here. Because Democrats and Republicans would get together with the members of the court and other people relevant to uh, our associations, and we would share a meal and, and talk and say that this was about civility and working together. Obviously, very divided branch as it relates to the Senate and the judiciary, but nonetheless. So I so appreciated the fact that even though that was disbanded, Justice Ginsburg invited the women for dinner. She invited the women senators to come over for dinner, and I think we might have invited a few of our ex-colleagues. I think Olympia Snow, the former congresswoman from Maine, uh, might have been there. So we invited some of our old colleagues, and it might have been um, a dinner for a newly added uh, justice to the court. But nonetheless, guess what we got with dinner? Great opera. Great opera. In fact, she had, I think, uh, two singers there that evening and entertained us. And, you know, it's that kind of spirit of people working together and showing that I think that was probably you know, what her relationship was with Antonin Scalia. It was, you know, probably that, yes, we're not always going to agree, but we're going to work together and we are going to figure out how to make the best of this situation and move forward. So I remember that even though this thing had been disbanded, she still took the time at least with the women, to say, you know what? We can all still work together. So whoever said that statement, good things come in small packages. They had it, they had it down when it came to Justice Ginsburg because in that very small package came a lot of wisdom that got applied to the rights, particularly of women, in the United States of America with a calm but forceful voice that has moved this ball down the road. It is up to all of us to continue her legacy and get equal pay for equal work and continue to protect these rights that are well established in the United States of America. I thank the president and I yield the floor and my thoughts and prayers are with the Ginsburg family.